our first panel um, is entitled Leveraging Reform, Legis Legislation for Reproductive Health. And one of our goals in these panels is to give you concrete examples of uh, programs that have to do with health reform, and also analyses and thinking about what the future of health care reform might look like. Um, this is a... Um, a particularly wonderful panel because we have someone with both a med one person with a medical background and one with a legal background. Um, so Susan Burke Fogel, JD, directs reproductive health and justice programs at NHELP, where she develops and implements initiatives to advance reproductive justice and health access for low-income women and adolescents. She has a particular focus on Medicaid and how Medicaid policies can be used to increase access to abortion, family planning, and pregnancy care. She's nationally known for her work on religious restrictions in health care and is a co-author of Health Care Refusals, Undermining Quality Care for Women, a foundational analysis of the impact of religious restrictions on medical standards of care and reproductive health. She began her legal career at the legal, legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles and previously was the legal director at the California Women's Law Center and a consultant for the Los Angeles County Office of Women's Health. She is the president of the California Coalition for Reproductive Freedom, the vice president of the City of Los Angeles Commission on the Status of Women, serves on several nonprofit boards, and is a co-founder of the Pro-Choice Alliance for Responsible Research that works to ensure that women's health and reproductive choices are protected in the context of emerging biotechnologies. She also teaches basic advocacy skills in reproductive health in the UCLA School of Public Health and received her BA in Art History from UCLA and her JD from Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Okay, so um, you may have heard I was an art history major, so I think about architecture um, and really want to talk about the structure of healthcare reform and what it means for reproductive health. And just tell you a little bit about NHELP. NHELP is the National Health Law Program we're a national nonprofit, and we work on access and quality of health care for low-income people. We do our work through litigation, policy analysis, trainings, and um, providing technical support to legal services agencies. Uh, this is Barbara Kruger. I don't think I have to remind you. Dr. Pollack talked about this. And um, I'm not actually going to talk about abortion restrictions. You're going to hear a lot about that during the day. What I really want to talk about, though, is how reproductive health can either be built into the systems that we develop or how barriers to reproductive health can be in those systems. But I definitely want to mention how important it is for us to be paying attention to abortion restrictions. We have had abortion restrictions in public health care, known as the Hyde Amendment, for 34 years. and. Um, it's a little frustrating to see that now that these same restrictions are being imported into private insurance and affecting the lives of middle class women, that there's a lot more outrage than we've seen over the past 34 years. So that's just my editorial comment. So I think that we're under such siege today that there, we are, you know, we're hearing attacks about abortion at the federal level, defunding Planned Parenthood at the federal level, defunding Planned Parenthood at, um, in Indiana, so at the state level, um, ugly, ugly restrictions, putting women through um, unnecessary procedures, forcing them to pay unnecessary costs. You know, one of the things we talk a lot about these unnecessary ultrasound laws in many states where women are forced to have an ultrasound because they're like too stupid to know that there actually is a fetus that could become a child inside them. Um, but we don't talk about the cost. Um, so we have a lot of, uh, I mean, women have to pay out of pocket for that service that they didn't want in the first place. And it's supposed to cause them to change their minds. Um, but we, we have to think about two things at once. So. You know, on the right here, we have Dorothea Lange, uh, Road to the West. You know, the bleak landscape um, that we could spend all day talking about. 
Um, but I also want to remind us that at this moment, we are building a new kind of healthcare system you know, with all its flaws. And you know, it's a private system, it's a commercial system. We can say a lot about that. Um, but we have to be able to hold on to two ideas at once. Because if we spend all our energy on the bleakness, um, just as the speaker said a few minutes ago, you know, the insurance companies are at the table, large corporate entities are at the table, and we have to be at the table too. So this is what health care reform is supposed to do. Everyone will have coverage, it'll be affordable, insurance co companies will be accountable, costs will be controlled. Um, now, of course, we know that everyone doesn't include undocumented persons, and coverage doesn't include abortion. I don't think I have to remind you that lack of insurance is a huge issue for low-income women, um, especially in communities of color. Um, so we you know, just need to also think about that. Also, as Dr. Pollack talked about the Medicaid expansion, um, as he said, just because you're poor doesn't mean that you can get Medicaid. And what is going to happen in 2014, and I also want to flag that states are, do have the ability to start expanding their Medicaid coverage now. They don't have to wait till 2014. And the other thing we have to remember is that 2014 is January 1st, 2014. So I like to think of it as December 31st, 2013, which means we really have to be paying attention now. So there are whole categories of women who right now don't have access to comprehensive health care, um, not even though they are poor. Uh, so, you know, childless, young adults, older women, um, low-income women tend to do their childbearing at younger ages, which means that the, the population of women who are like 55 to 64 have high rates of uninsurance because they no longer have a dependent child. And, um, and many other women who have chronic health conditions, uh, but right now can get family planning services perhaps, but um, you go into a family planning visit, and as Dr. Pollack pointed out, you know, they take your blood pressure, they say there's something wrong, now you are SOL. Because um, it's not a family planning service anymore that you need, um, all of this is gonna change. And I will tell you that given all of the flaws, I think this can be transformational for low-income women. Um, I, and I also, I was struck with some things that Dr. Pollock said about the political climate, because the people on, I will just say right-left, the people on the right hate it, so they trash it all the time, and the reality is that people on the left, um, or also trash it for what it isn't. So some people hate it for what it is, some people hate it for what it isn't. Doesn't surprise me at all that the public is really ambivalent about it. Um, I also want to say there's a Japanese concept called wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi is embracing the imperfect in the natural world and the imperfect um, in design, and that's my PowerPoints. They're very wabi-sabi. I'm not very good at this. Um, so. This is pretty much how it's going to lay out. Um, I want to do, this is a very quick overview, but um, people who make under 133% of the federal poverty line will have access to Medicaid. And remember also, we're talking about coverage, and I'm going to talk a little bit in a few minutes about the difference between what coverage means and actually getting what you need. People from 134% of the federal poverty line to 400 will, in, will be, can be in the exchange, which means they can buy their insurance. There are insurance reforms. Um, there are federal subsidies. Um, undocumented people can't buy into the exchange with their own money. This is obviously a huge flaw. Um, and people over 400% of poverty can buy into the exchange. I think that some of this is going to evolve. Um, one of the things um, I think of Donald Rumsfeld's with his, there's knowns and known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And I think that sums up health reform. <laughs> A lot of people are left out. And when we think about this, this, what the safety net needs to look like, we really have to pay a lot of attention to the fact that everybody isn't everybody. 
Um, so not only are undocumented immigrants explicitly left out, we know that there are a lot of people who aren't going to be able to be in the system. We have people who are eligible for coverage today who can't get into systems for any variety of reasons. So we need to pay attention to that. So let's, this is um, very quick. Uh, one of the things um, that is we hope is going to be very good is that plans are going to have to cover, plans in the exchange are going to have to cover what are called essential health benefits. Um, and these are very broad categories. We're expecting some more detail from the um, Department of Health and Human Services in September. Uh, it's when we think that a lot of regulations are going to start coming out. Um, and there is an Institute of Medicine commission uh, that is making recommendations on what kind of how to put more meat on these bones about what the essential health benefits need to look like. But they will be required in plans that want to play in the exchange. And so the flip side um, of what the women who raised the questions about, you know, what's wrong with health reform. So one of the things um, is that the insurers are going to want to play in the exchange. It's millions, it's true, it's millions and millions of new customers for them. But if we do this right, uh, there's also opportunities to provide better service. And maybe this will be a pathway to a universal health system. I mean, I'm there too, but we're not, the country is not. And um, um, this is just a very quick overview of who gets Medicaid and how it will change. And the big change is the category. So right now, in order to qualify for Medicaid, you need to be, uh, have a dependent child, be poor, blind, generally, or aged. It's the kind of the, or that's kind of the broad categories. Um, and every state has a different eligibility level. So some states, Indiana, I think you only get Medicaid if it's, I think it's 23% of the federal poverty line, which is what? It's like if you make more than $6,000 a year, you're too rich for Medicaid. So this 133% is huge. And, um, and there also is an expansion family planning. I think Adam's going to talk about this a little more, so I just want to mention it. But there's an opportunity for states, there's 28 states so far, to expand family planning services to people of higher incomes. So I really just want to focus on the state, what's going to happen in the states. The federal regulations are really important. What's going on in the Congress is really important. Uh, but how health reform really gets implemented so it affects people in their daily lives is happening at the state level. There's a lot of quote unquote flexibility to the states. That's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where you live, to be perfectly honest. Um, and there's no question that community organizations and others need to be at the table because the insurance companies are there. And, um, and we have a vested interest in designing a system that really works for people. So here are two options. Um, on the right, open, transparent, airy. You can see what's there. This is Philip Johnson's glass house. I have this tendency to call it the Philip glass house, which of course it's not. On the left is, um, is a very famous building called the Winchester Mystery House. It was built over like 100 years, and there are hallways that go everywhere and stairways to no place. Um, and um, this is probably what our system looks like now. But we really have a chance to build Philip Johnson's house. The basic structure is the exchange. One of my colleagues calls it sort of like Travelocity or Kayak. Um, and in theory, there will be a, a web portal. There will be community-based organizations who, who are called navigators. It will help people figure out what they qualify for and how to get the coverage that they need. There are lots of questions, things that can be determined at the state level, what insurers can participate. In, uh, at, you know, on, on Kayak, I've noticed, you know, um, what is it, Southwest isn't on Kayak. JetBlue is. Um, it can be the state can have a lot of control over who participates or can just say all comers can be in the exchange. A uh, lot of questions about the interplay with Medicaid. How will that work? Uh, who's going to qualify for what? 
which providers, and I'm going to talk a bit about providers, and basically do people really get what they need. I will say that um, for states, unfortunately, for us, um, there's a big incentive for states to actually put people in the exchange and to erect barriers to them getting into Medicaid. Because Medicaid, as you know, is a state-federal partnership where the federal government pays a percentage and the state pays a percentage. Uh, in the early years of the Medicaid expansion, the federal government is going to pay the overwhelming um, cost of the newly eligible, the new people who fit in this new 133% category. Um, but there's still a lot of state money on the table. In the exchange, there's really no state money on the table. Um, and this is one of the things that we have to be thinking about. It's federal subsidies for low-income people. It's individual premiums. This is a commercial insurance system. Um, and there, the state doesn't have an investment. And, um, and so we have to be careful to make sure that people who qualify for Medicaid are actually going to be able to get into the Medicaid program. So this is sort of what it's going to look like. You're going to have the exchange. And in order to be in the exchange, you have to be something called a qualified health plan, for which there are a lot of criteria. There'll be Medicaid. And also, um, there's actually two kinds of Medicaid after 2014. There's the regular Medicaid, which are all those people who are, have dependent children or age blind or disabled. Um, they will still qualify for old-fashioned Medicaid. And then there's newly eligible Medicaid. And newly eligible Medicaid people can be put into a regular health plan, like a Blue Shield um, or whatever um, Anthem, WellPoint, whatever health plans are really prevalent in the state. So they can actually have a more limited scope of benefits. Um, qualified health plans have to comply with the insurance reforms, which means no gender rating. It can't exclude people based on pre-existing conditions. There's certain um, caps on what they call the medical loss ratio, on how much goes to administration, how much has to go to services. Um, there's some very good insurance reforms. Um, and the other thing that qualified health plans have to do is they have to prove they have network adequacy. Network adequacy meaning that they are, their network of providers uh, is sufficient to meet the needs of the people in the geographical area that the network um, serves and provides all of the covered services. Now all of these, I'm going to digress for a minute and I'm going to talk about um, this is uh, just some sort of basic information about religiously controlled facilities and health plans because they're going to be big players in the system. And we start thinking about providers, when we think about network adequacy, what we think about what health plans have to cover. It's really important to recognize that um, Catholic, the Catholic healthcare system in the United States um, is one of the largest healthcare systems. Um, that we have, both, both nonprofit and for profit. Uh, the Catholic Health Association itself says that one in six Americans is seen in a Catholic hospital every year. And we know that Catholic hospitals um, are often, in many rural areas in particular, they are what are called sole provider hospitals, which means they're the only hospital. So the idea that somebody can go somewhere else to get the services they need, and obviously we're talking about reproductive health services mostly, although we are also talking about some forms of end of life care. So the idea that you can go somewhere else um, actually often is simply not the case. Um, Catholic health systems in particular, and I will say there are other systems that restrict reproductive health. Um, there are Adventist systems that don't provide abortion care. Some Baptist hospitals have some restrictions. Um, but I'm focusing on Catholic hospitals only because, A, there is a, um, a very large system. I think four out of 10 of the largest hospital systems in the country are Catholic systems. Also, because there's a very hierarchical system of control going up to the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, very direct control, and also because there are clear rules which other religious um, healthcare delivery systems don't actually have. 
So basically, they are, there is a document called the Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Healthcare Services, and it really lays out what is permitted and what is not. So what is not permitted is abortion, any abortion, anything that's called an abortion, and basically something that's called an abortion is something where there is a heartbeat um, is an abortion. Um, sterilization, family planning, uh, there are limits on the treatment of miscarriage management. There was a, a very good article um, called When There's a Heartbeat by Lori Friedman that was published in the American Journal of Public Health. IVAS Reproductive Health Services has also, uh, who you'll hear from later, have um, published some articles about the restrictions that exist in Catholic hospitals. The, unlike the public funding where we have an exception for uh, pregnancies due to rape or incest or pregnancies that put the woman's life in danger, there actually are no exceptions. Um, and the refusal to make referrals as we think of a managed care world is a barrier um, for many women. So a refusal clause, just a quick review, a refusal clause, also called a conscience clause, is basically legal permission to opt out of doing something that you would otherwise have to do. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to have a refusal clause. So there's a duty. So either there's a law that says you have to provide a service. So for example, many states have laws that say emergency rooms have to provide emergency contraception to women who are victims of sexual assault if the woman wants it. Um, or there may be a duty, medical standards of care that say in certain situations, um, terminating a pregnancy is the appropriate standard of care. Uh, women with perhaps hypertension, women who's, uh, who have perhaps lupus, other chronic diseases, diabetes that are out of control, her life is at risk or in danger. The medical literature says she should be advised of her options and she should be able to make a decision whether or not she wants to continue this pregnancy. A refusal, and if she wants to discontinue the pregnancy, um, and if the hospital refuses to do that under normal circumstances, that might be a medical malpractice. Something terrible happens, the woman dies or she almost dies. Um, there are stories that Lori Friedman has captured of um, women in premature rupture of membranes, in terrible distress, she's gone into sepsis, this doctor's reporting, she has 106 fever, um, he, and he says, she is dying before our eyes, there's a heartbeat, the hospital says you can't terminate the pregnancy. Now, under normal circumstances, we would think that's malpractice. Refusal clause might say, would say that no hospital, you are shielded from liability from terminating that pregnancy. So I want to make sure that we're thinking about it in that way. It also, we're not also just talking about individual physicians um, or other healthcare providers who's, who are making their own decisions about what they want or don't want to provide in terms of services. We're talking about systems that are telling willing providers you can't provide those services in our systems. And I just want to really make very clear that, that this means absolutely no exceptions. Um, as you can see, the US Catholic Conference has said there are no exceptions. And um, this is the Q&A. There's a lot of news about a hospital in, Chicago, in uh, Arizona and Phoenix. Uh, Catholic Healthcare was Catholic Hospital, Catholic Healthcare West. A woman comes in, she's 11 weeks pregnant, she has severe hypertension, history of heart disease, and the doctors decide that her life is at risk. There's an ethics committee, there's a nun who sits on this ethics committee, and even she agrees that under this circumstance that this pregnancy needs to be terminated, this woman is going to die. They terminate the pregnancy. Um, and the um, Archdiocese of Phoenix uh, finds out about it, and this becomes national news. And so the Archdiocese put out a Q&A. You know, what, what was going on? Why did they make this decision? And this is from their decision, that sometimes both the woman and the child, the fetus, the unborn child, have to die. So let's go back to our Philip Johnson glass house. Um, so we think about 
what it means to have a qualified health plan, um, what it means to have network adequacy, um, who are the providers in those systems. These are the areas where we are building something that we hope is going to serve the needs of our communities. So I just want to go through each of these in a little more detail. Essential community providers is actually a term of art. It's in the Affordable Care Act. And one of the things that qualified health plans have to do um, is they have to contract with essential community providers and have them in their networks. And who are essential community providers? They're providers such as family planning clinics, community health centers, federally qualified health centers, the, the sources that we think of as safety net providers. Um, what is not crystal clear and we're, we're hoping will be crystal clear in the regulations, is that they really do need to contract with fa family planning clinics and clinics that provide family planning services. Um, in, uh, there's a, a small form, uh, farm community in cent the Central Valley in California, and uh, there's one hospital there, um, St. Louise, and it's a Catholic hospital. And the hospital controls and owns the community clinic. And when the hospital, it used to be a community hospital, and when the Catholic system took it over, they told the folks in the community center, quote, take those condoms off your desks. So we want to make sure that it's not enough to be a community health center. Um, but they are community health centers and safety nets that are really providing all the family planning services that we need. The other thing we want to make sure is that they actually contract with these providers to provide the full range of services that they offer. What we don't want to see is systems contracting with the Planned Parenthood clinic only to provide pap smears and breast exams. So we want to make sure that family planning is integrated. Um, and now, in, as we all know, uh, was Mitch Daniels, day before yesterday, signed a bill that said that no state or federal funds can go to Planned Parenthood in Indiana. Um, there's a perfect example of um, what would happen if we had a healthcare, if we had an exchange and we allowed qualified health plans in Indiana not to contract with family planning providers. Um, the other issue is network adequacy. So what does it mean to have an adequate network? We would like to argue that a network is not adequate unless all of the covered services and the services that people need are available in that network. Um, we, um, we worked with a provider who had a client, a patient, she came in for a second trimester abortion. And the abortion provider said to her, why you know, why, what happened? Why are you so late? Like, what took you so long? And she said, well, I tried to get an abortion about three and a half weeks ago, but my primary care provider wouldn't give me a referral because he's opposed to abortion. And my managed care organization wouldn't approve the abortion, it's a covered service in her plan, wouldn't approve the abortion without a referral from my primary care provider. For three and a half weeks, this woman fought up the food chain and this, believe me, um, is not going to change <laughs> under health reform, except um, we need to make sure that there are some protections in place that she, this woman has a provider that she can go to. Um, benchmark plans, I don't really want to spend a lot of time about that, but this is a, this is a way of putting Medicaid into the commercial market. Um, there is a big push, especially right now, with the states um, struggling with their fiscal condition uh, to, in, to engage in much more managed care. The state of Florida just passed legislation to put all Medicaid enrollees in mandatory managed care. Um, and I will tell you that in Florida's list of, of required services is family planning. Plans must cover family planning, but there's a refusal clause. So it says they must cover family planning unless they don't want to cover family planning. And these are the kinds of things that we really need to fight against. Um, and the other thing that we're going to really struggle with is transitions. How will people transition from one system to another? Um, this is, an, is very important for, um, we know that low income people's um, incomes fluctuate. Right now, we see this in children's health, by the way. We have children who qualify for Medicaid, and when their family income is a little bit higher, 
they may f qualify for the children's health insurance plan, whatever it's called in the state. Um, but those are both public programs. And so we kind of know how to do those transitions. But when we have a family that's making 130% of poverty and something changes in their circumstances and now their income is to 145% of poverty, now they have to transition between a public plan and a private plan and back and forth. Um, and this is especially critical for women because women uh, from 134 to 185 generally, 185% of poverty, will qualify for Medicaid when they're pregnant, but they won't qualify for Medicaid when they're not pregnant. Um, and so how do we get them into a good system of care? How do we make sure that they have continuity of care? Um, in California, we actually had to sue the state because the state was taking women and putting them, even if they were four or five months pregnant, putting them into managed care for what, the last three months of their pregnancy, completely disrupting their care. Um, they had to find a new provider. So these are all you know, wonky kind of weedy things, but they actually matter. So I am a cheerleader for the Affordable Care Act for low-income women. Um, there's a lot wrong with it, I'm the first to admit it, but I really think that we have an opportunity to do something really important. And, um, and it's happening in the states. This is where we have the opportunity to do something important. You know, California, I'm from California, California was the first state to pass a, a bill um, to actually implement its exchange. The exchange board had its first meeting um, they, everybody knows that 2014 is like six months ago. There's a lot of work to be done, but we have opportunities. We have opportunities in some states. You know, a lot of states are trying to pass or have passed bans on covering, uh, covering abortion in their exchanges. So taking the public funding ban and moving it into private insurance. Um, but not every state is doing that. And, um, and actually, there are a lot of states that aren't doing that. And there are ways of taking the restrictions that are in the Affordable Care Act, which you know are basically, just to make, I I'm, I'm think somebody else is talking about this, but just to kind of connect the dots. The Affordable Care Act doesn't say plans can't cover abortion. What it does say is that if plans do cover abortion, they have to segregate the funds. And everybody has to pay a dollar, at least a minimum dollar a month premium uh, for that insurance coverage. Not just women who want <laughs> abortion coverage, it's not like a, a rider, just everybody in the plan that covers abortion. Of course, the Republicans in Congress trying to make this much worse. But as it stands now, um, Insurance companies actually do know how to segregate funds, and states can make it easier for them to do this. It could be seamless. We could come up with a really bad system where the state sends a notice every month and says, pay us $1 separate check for your abortion coverage. We want you to be really mad that you have to pay for abortion coverage. They could do that, or they could make it really simple. And, you know, as one of my colleagues said, you know, when I pay my mortgage, um, I may write one check, right? And I pay my interest, and I pay my, pre uh, my principal, and maybe I pay my taxes, and maybe I pay my insurance. We can make this easier, and we think this is going to have to happen at the state level. We may get some good guidance out of the feds. We'll see. Um, but these are the kinds of things that we could focus on in order to make it better. Um, we certainly want to make sure that we keep family planning expansions. And we want to make sure that we fight for the special funding for um, the Ryan White funding, which is for people with HIV and AIDS, um, family planning, Title X family planning funding. There are pots of money not just the, including the public health, the new public health money, but there's old pots of money that have been really effective um, in meeting people's needs, and we want to fight for them. We want comprehensive coverage of contraceptives. The other thing that the Institute of Medicine is working on are recommendations 
for preventive services and women's health that will be required under those preventive service lists under essential health benefits. So we want to see comprehensive um, contraceptive coverage. We want women to be able to choose the method that works best for them and have it covered. We want to reduce the access barriers, which really means recognizing that there are systems that um, institutionally have barriers for women and that those systems don't control the health care that we can get. Um, and we want to make sure that there's a safety net for all of us. So that's our website. For those of you who are interested, we have a very um, extensive analysis of the Affordable Care Act that actually breaks it down um, piece by piece. Uh, and for the wonks, I'm sure there are a bunch of wonks here like me. Um, and that's my email. And I'd be happy to um, respond to any questions you think of later. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Our next speaker is Dr. Deborah Stelberg. Dr. Stelberg is a family physician with a clinical and research focus on racial and socioeconomic disparities in reproductive health care and the effects of re religious hospital sponsorship on delivery of care. She joined the faculty of the University of Chicago in 2007 with a primary appointment in family medicine and a secondary appointment in obstetrics and gynecology within the section of family planning and the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. She is also a founding board member of the Midwest Access Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving access to reproductive health care in the region through education and training of health care providers in the public. Dr. Stolberg graduated from Harvard Medical School and completed her family medicine residency at West Suburban Hospital in Oak Park, Illinois. She received a Master of Masters of Arts in Public Policy from the University of Chicago while completing fellowship training in clinical medical ethics and health services research. She provides full scope primary care at the Friend Family Health Center on Chicago's South Side and provides and teaches comprehensive reproductive health care at All Women's Health, an independent clinic in Chicago's Northwest Side. Thank you, Deborah. Hi. Thank you, Melissa. Before I get started, um, I also want to introduce Colleen Grogan, who's sitting at this front table here. Um, I had a little deadline challenge with my submission. I think I uh, told Lee about a month before this deadline that I was planning to submit, and then about a day before the deadline, <laughs> I emailed Colleen and said, want to co-author this submission with me? And uh, <laughs> Colleen got back to me and said, yeah, that would be great, and I have some additional ideas, but unfortunately that was after the deadline. So my name is on the, is on the talk, but Colleen and I are working on this together, and she contributed a lot of important ideas, so I may direct some questions to Colleen as we go forward. Just briefly, what we're going to um, talk about in this session, um, I'll give a little bit of background on reproductive health. Um, the status of reproductive health in the U.S. and reproductive health care, areas where we could be doing better at improving reproductive health. Um, I am going to uh, talk about ectopic pregnancy, which is a focus of my research, and um, I think it uh, illustrates a lot of the issues in delivering reproductive health care, especially to vulnerable populations. Um, Susan and I know each other from uh, long-standing work on religious restrictions in healthcare, and this was where my interest in ectopic pregnancy, those are the issues that Susan mentioned where Catholic hospitals may treat patients with ectopic pregnancy differently from other hospitals, it actually spurred my interest in ectopic pregnancy and then came to be an issue that I understood um, really is affected by uh, insurance and access to care in a lot of, and not just by religious hospital sponsorship. So I'll say a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll move into talking about the um, law itself. Um, as we've heard, um, there is significant expansion in reproductive health coverage, although not as much as we would like. Um, so I'll say a little bit about ways that that, um, that, that we hope that will play out. And then um, the health insurance exchanges um, that both Dr. Pollock and um, call you Susan, we should call you Ms. Fogel, <laughs> um, uh, or Dr. Fogel, um, have talked about uh, how those 
are designed ideally to guarantee or at least incentivize improvements in care, higher quality care, um, but that those improvements depend on information or data about the care that's being provided. And um, what I'm hoping is that we will have a uh, sort of positive reinforcement cycle where more coverage of services leads to better and more collection of data, and that data allows us to then go on to improve care even more. Um, so I'll talk about what this new data will be and who can hopefully use it and who can benefit from it. So reproductive health in the US is not a great picture. Um, in maternal mortality, we're 39th in the world, putting us right below Lithuania and Singapore, and this rate, the maternal mortality rate, appears to be rising in the US. Um, unintended pregnancy is still about half of all pregnancies, even though we have excellent contraceptive methods. We're not um, effectively getting those to people who need them. Um, Chlamydia infection, which can lead to um, infertility, ectopic pregnancy, et cetera, in women, um, appears to still be rising. This may in part be due to um, increased screening and reporting, but the CDC estimates still that about half of all cases of a chlamydia are undetected. Um, in infant mortality, we're just below Cuba and Cyprus. And um, intimate partner violence, um, Estimates are that um, one in four women um, have experienced um, uh, abuse um, within their intimate relationships. And um, I hate to sort of start with a depressing picture, um, but partly why I give these examples is um, to encourage us to think broadly about what is reproductive health. Um, is infant mortality an issue of reproductive health? Is intimate partner violence an issue of reproductive health? Um, each of these issues is in and of themselves complex to, um, to improve them, to um, take care of people experiencing them, and um, even to measure them is complex. Um, so there's no single um, answer or approach, but I would argue that each contributes to overall well-being of people as relates to their reproduction, reproductive capacity, or sex life. Um, and so I'm um, using a fairly broad definition of, of reproductive health. That said, um, as, as we've already heard and we will discuss further, some areas, um, have been better covered. So we have, for example, the CHIP program, which covers all children up to certain income, incomes, but certainly covers more children um, than before CHIP. Um, and there are other areas within reproductive health where we really have been deprived in coverage. Um, so not all reproductive health is the same. Even if we use a broad definition of reproductive health, we may need to look narrowly within that definition to see where differences um, in, our, in our coverage and care uh, may exist. Um, sorry, more depressing statistics. <laughs> In addition to not being overall very good, our reproductive health also is not evenly distributed in its goodness or badness. Um, as we all know, some people are more harmed by, um, I guess you might want to say reproductive disease or lack of reproductive wellness. Um, so for example, um, uh, African American women are four times more likely to die from pregnancy than white women. I feel like that's a really easy number to say and put up there, but if you actually think about what that means, becoming a mom is more four times more likely to kill you if you happen to be black. Um, that's depressing, and that actually includes if we only focus on preventable causes of maternal mortality. That that disparity holds. Um, new HIV infections are seven times higher in blacks compared to whites and three times higher in Hispanics compared to whites. Um, again, certainly a, a preventable condition. Um, and um, unintended pregnancy, um, I highlighted on this slide the disparity by um, income. It, the rate is almost two times uh, uh, higher among people who are poor, people who's income is below the poverty line compared to people whose income is two times higher than the poverty line. We also know there's a racial disparity um, in unintended pregnancy and that in fact the racial disparity holds even within income groups. So this is not just a confounding between race and income, but that um, there are things related to income and things related to race that um, affect someone's likelihood of having an unintended pregnancy. Um, 
I really appreciated that Harold did a very good po point, made a, uh, did a very good job of pointing out that health care does not determine health. There are lots of things that determine health other than health care, um, individual and systemic factors such as foods that people ac have access to and eat, the air we breathe, our physical activity. Um, but many conditions we know can be prevented, and access to high quality health care is an important factor in health. So it is not the only factor, but it is an important factor. Um, and um, so we know that we could be doing a lot better. And I'll just highlight four aspects of our system that um, appear not to be working uh, so great. So one is simply access. And, and um, the situation before the health reform law, um, people of reproductive age, broadly speaking, um, so uh, young adults, um, or if you want to think about it in insurance terms, people you know, too old for CHIP, but not old enough for Medicare, <laughs> um, historically have been um, one of the least likely groups to, or among the most least likely to actually have insurance that will cover care. Um, and this is partly because uh, in the younger adult years, our, our employment patterns tend to be less settled. We may have temporary jobs, and so we're in an employer-based health insurance system, we may not um, latch on to an employer that provides us that insurance. Um, uh, do you like how I say we as if I'm a young adult? I'll, I'll keep going with that myth for now. <laughs> um, uh, at, also, because young people tend to be healthier, they, in a private system that people can opt in or out, opt out, they rationally um, often choose not to buy in. Um, and so uh, one of the benefits of, of health reform is, in fact, to get some of those healthier people into the pool of insured. Um, even when people who need coverage in their young adult years or their reproductive health years um, have insurance, often they are in plans that lack coverage for reproductive health services. Um, again, these could include everything from lacking coverage of, of broad scope prevention like pap smears or coverage of contraception, even coverage of maternity care um, has been carved out. And then um, should you be so lucky as to have insurance and then have insurance that covers your reproductive health services, often the quality and continuity of care is not what we would like it to be. Um, there's a, a newish and growing concept of the medical home, which um, basically is uh, a way of describing what I think we all wish our doctor's office or our healthcare provider's office or practice was, which is that it's it's accessible when we need it. We can see our provider. We um, you know know who our provider is, and they know something about us. And if we need nutrition services, there's someone that we can go to for that. And there's a team leader overseeing the whole thing. And um, that model where uh, sort of ideal model of continuity of care and, and access to our provider when we need them um, is an ideal. Lots of clinics and practices don't meet that ideal. Um, and if you've tried to get health care recently, you, the likelihood is you've experienced the lack of medical hominess of your doctor's office, right? They you wait 10 minutes or 30 minutes on the phone, and then you're told, yeah, maybe you can be seen in two weeks, and if you have an urgent condition, you should go to the urgent care center, but will the doctor that you're going to see next week for follow-up get the information from the urgent care center and the tests they did? Maybe not. So, you know, good luck. <laughs> um, so, and an example that I see a lot in practice um, as relates to discontinuity um, it has to do with starting um, someone on a new birth control method. A lot of people have um, questions about their birth control method after they leave the office with the prescription. And when they have those questions or when they have a side effect that they're not sure, is this a serious side effect or is this something mild that I can soldier through, um, can they get someone on the phone? Can they get back in to see that provider to check in, is this method working? Um, if they get someone on the phone and the doctor says go to the emergency room, or is it, again, is the doctor you know, who you see in follow-up going to get the results of your test that you had in the emergency? You, you get the picture. Um, so as a result, 
what do people often do? They stop taking the method that we've written them that prescription for. And we know that that unintended pregnancy rate, one of the um, things we've had the hardest time chipping away at as a system is the discontinuation rate with birth control methods. Um, so, so I would argue that improving continuity of care may in fact decrease the unintended pregnancy rate if we could get that follow-up for those birth control methods. Um, and then la lastly, lack of core coordination or what I might call fragmentation of care. Um, and this uh, ectopic pregnancy, again, will be an example that I'm going to say a little bit more about. But the classic situation is um, I know that I was pregnant. I started to have a little bleeding and pain. I went to the emergency room. I think they may have done a pap smear and maybe an ultrasound. They told me I was like six weeks, but they said to come back and see my doctor because it might be in my tube. And I, as the doctor, hearing that story, I have no idea what that patient actually had. I don't necessarily have the results of their key tests for which, you know, it's not enough to know that you were six weeks and the pregnancy may have been in your tube. I need to know the number of that test result. And so these, um, these discontinuities and um, people getting um, care from multiple systems, multiple providers without uh, any connection between them um, can be a real problem in quality of care. There is, um, we haven't talked yet about the um, health reform laws, um, incentives for increased electronic communications and electronic record keeping. There certainly is some potential for improvement in this fragmentation through, if, if we can implement good electronic um, information sharing across providers. Um, so briefly, um, what is ectopic pregnancy? Um, basically, uh, if, if a woman becomes pregnant, there's a fertilized egg, but rather than implanting in the um, endometrium of the uterus, it implants any place else, although most commonly that's the fallopian tube. Um, the, the pregnancy, the fetus can't survive. It can only grow and become a viable pregnancy in the uterine endometrium. And if it continues to grow, say, in the fallopian tube or um, on the outside wall of the uterus or wherever it might have um, accidentally implanted, um, it can, um, the organ where it's implanted can rupture and the woman can basically bleed to death through internal hemorrhage. Um, and um, in some ways, this is actually a condition where we have this sort of modern medical miracle. It used to be that ectopic pregnancy was almost always fatal because you didn't know you had an ectopic pregnancy until your fallopian tube ruptured, you started bleeding, and if you got into care quickly and they could um, remove the fallopian tube and tie off all the arteries and, you know, you would survive. But if you didn't have it, if you didn't get, ha get so lucky, then you would die. What m modern gynecologic care has, has provided is the ability to detect the condition early. Um, and if you get into care early with either early warning signs or sometimes through routine prenatal care. Um, the condition can be detected early and um, now treated non-invasively. You may not even need surgery to remove the, the tube. You can take a medicine um, that will essentially dissolve the pregnancy. Um, so great, we're doing great with our medical care, except where we're not, which is for a lot of people. So for example, there was a study published in the New England Journal a few years ago and the study was just looking at access to urgent care. But um, very nicely, one of the conditions they studied um, was ectopic pregnancy. And what this study did is they had researchers pose as patients. And they called an urgent care center and said, I was just seen in the emergency room yesterday. And the emergency room doctor told me I need to get in to see a doctor within the next, and I think they said five days or a week or whatever, um, can I come see you? And um, then they were told that they had one of several conditions, either, you know, I forget if it was, you know, chest pain or um, ectopic pregnancy or one other thing. And, and what they found is that uh, in all the conditions, but including ectopic pregnancy, if you didn't have insurance or if you had Medicaid, you were less likely to be given a timely appointment. So again, the emergency room doctor does their test. They uh, say, you're okay for now, go home, go back and see a doctor in the next few days. But if you don't have the Blue Cross Blue Shield card, good luck finding a doctor that will take you. Um, so access to care is an issue. And then um, there also are studies looking at this follow-up process. And um, in this 
in several treatment protocols, especially if you're going to get the non-invasive treatment where you're, you're taking the medicine, it's called tre methotrexate, part of the protocol of care actually requires you to go back to the doctor or to the healthcare provider every few days um, until you have no pregnancy hormone left in your body. And that can be a couple of weeks. And so getting um, a, a, an appointment with a doctor um, who's going to follow those levels um, can be a real challenge. So um, that's ectopic pregnancy, and again, I will use it to sort of illustrate a few things going forward. Um, the good thing about the health reform law um, is that this population, the young adults um, who previously were the least likely to have coverage, um, have many new options for care. We've heard about um, staying on your parents' insurance for longer. We've heard about expanded Medicaid access, and of course, the, the new exchange plans. Um, the, I, I had to look up this 400% of the poverty level um, who will get subsidies under the exchange. H who of us is that? It turns out that's more than 60% of the US population. So that's uh, nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> um, in addition to more people being covered, um, more services will be covered. Under the US Preventive Services Task Force that um, Harold told us about, there are services such as screening for cervical cancer, screening for chlamydia, screening for breast cancer that will be covered. Whether or not um, contraception and abortion and other essential services will be covered as essential services remains to be seen. Um, I won't say a lot about Massachusetts because we have two wonderful speakers this afternoon who have done a great body of work on the Massachusetts experience and I've just read their work. So what I will say um, is that when Massachusetts instituted health reform, as expected, what we saw was that that young adult population was one of the biggest um, expansions. So more than the population overall, the young adults suddenly had an expansion in their coverage. Um, and they did not suddenly get all the reproductive health services they need. So there are gaps. Um, and I think those are important for us to think about going forward. Um, the important thing about the exchanges is that they are designed not just to provide coverage, but in theory to provide good and improving coverage. They can do this in two ways, and this is what um, Colleen taught me, is called contracting theory. So I, um, I'll do, again let Colleen say a little bit more about that in question and answer, but um, Really, there are a couple different ways. The first is that simply they create a marketplace rather than just a single option. People can actually choose which plan to buy into. They also allow the states who are issuing the contracts with the plans to use those contracts to hold the plans accountable for good care on behalf of the patient. So if you as a consumer or a patient don't know how to dissect all this information about your health plan or your health provider, what we're hoping is that the state will in part be a proxy for you and will hold those plans accountable to providing good care. This requires information. So this is where the data comes in. And here's my attempt to make what otherwise would be, I think, a very nerdy topic sound a little bit interesting. <laughs> um, but basically, um, anytime you go to the doctor, there's information gathered about you, right? Your doctor knows your age. They know, um, you know probably your address. And they make a diagnosis. When they're billing your insurance company, they write that diagnosis code down, and they also write down any procedures that they did for you. So if they inserted your IUD, there's a procedure code for IUD insertion, and that gets sent to your insurance company. Well, that's all um, data. <laughs> and uh, if you only have that level of information, dates of birth, dates of service, diagnosis code, procedure code, we call that administrative data. If you also have what was the test result? So we know she had an x-ray. An x-ray is a procedure code. But what was the result of the x-ray? Well, that's sort of what, that's a little more detailed and we would call that clinical data. In um, the era of EMRs, that clinical data can be stored and shared in ways, again, hoping certainly to protect privacy, but also can be potentially aggregated to say, um, X number of women had an ultrasound at an appropriate time, and of those women, X, of, X proportion of them truly had the ectopic pregnancy. So we can assess, was this a correct diagnosis? We can assess more detailed quality um, outcomes. So um, 
here's the kicker, and this is going to be, I have to um, warn you, a little bit ugly, but I want to give a sense of potentially how we could use this data, because it is, there are lots of, um, th there's a lot of promise there. Um, our ultimate hope is that the consumer, or if you're a po political scientist, the citizen, or if you're a doctor, the patient, um, is going to benefit. And that benefit's going to happen through a relationship with a healthcare provider. Um, but in the system, we know that there's actually an intermediary, um, uh, especially in the data exchange, um, and or the data sharing, and that intermediary is the exchange and the menu of plans, the different health plans within the exchange. So the exchange, um, each plan contracts with different potential providers, and then each person picks a plan. So one place the data can be used is in picking a plan. Am I thinking I might become pregnant in the next year, or am I someone who already had a hysterectomy? If I already had a hysterectomy, I might not be so worried about their quality of care for prenatal services, right? So I can use that information about quality of care within the different plans to select a plan that's going to be good for me. Um, then the other really important party, as we talked about, is the state, which is both the payer and the regulator, and the state acting on behalf of the consumer through the contracts that it makes with plans. So it can say, you have to provide access and meaning X number of um, family planning clinics, X number of doctors, X number of hospitals, and the care that those providers provide has to be of a certain quality. If you don't provide that quality and that access, we can cut off your contract. And then of course, ideally, the consumers are holding the state accountable through voting. In the middle and really, what should be in the background is also the public health researcher who also should be able to use this data um, through, again, you know, privacy protected but access to the data where you know, we can look and say, is this care being done well? Where could we improve it? What trends and patterns do we see? And then lastly, the ultimate hope is that you know, that sort of was the direction of accountability, that the direction of benefit is, again, going back to the consumer and going back to the state to make sure they're getting good value for the dollars they're spending. Um, final recommendations, and I'm past my one minute point, but um, again, our hope is that, and we can, you can talk in Q&A a little bit about how likely is this to happen, but our hope is that data collection and reporting will be required of plans in the exchanges, and that this data will be made available and accessible to consumers as well as researchers and the states to hold, hold plans accountable. Um, that the data itself will be of good quality. I didn't go into depth in ways that data can be um, better or worse, but it's important that they're providing not just information, but usable, high quality information. And finally, that that data collection and monitoring will be funded within the system. And I will end there. Thank you. So we have time for questions and answers. And then um, after the session, we'll have a quick 15 minute break so people can refresh coffee and find restrooms. There, there was some discussion about uh, waiting times for appointments based on insurance. Just wondering about the. Uh, the, the, the legal implications of that and uh, whether there's anybody in enforce any po possible legal implications related to that. Um, I can say that there are incentives built into the system to hold providers and plans accountable on some of those measures, including things like wait times. Now again, how robust those incentivizations and accountabilities will be. I mean, it takes uh, resources, it takes funding to have people, um, for example, uh, investigating, is this practice a medical home? And if it is, we should give it a bonus. And if it isn't, we should give it incentives to become a medical home. Um, doing that behind the scenes work to encourage those improvements in the system takes um, effort and resources. So. 
what I see, and other people may know the details of the law better, is that those ideas were built into the law, but their ability to be implemented and enforced is up in the air with the, with the funding. I think that's also um, sometimes a matter of state regulation of uh, managed care companies. So that may be another area uh, where the state could be more involved. There is, um, there is an, an, a, an office of innovations in HHS um, looking at innovative you know, proposals for and encouraging innovative practices. Um, so, but I don't know if that's actually on their agenda. Yeah, um, I have a couple of very quick questions. Uh, and I'm really trying very hard to like this plan. Mm. I, I must um, say I'm a single payer advocate. I'm trying to find the good parts, so, but my head is getting really. So I have a couple of questions, very quick. One question is the effect of age rating on the insurance premiums. You said everybody, there aren't going to be no pre-existing uh, pre conditions barred, but I do believe there's supposed to be age rating, and I want to know how that is going to affect women. Um, and um, I also, again, people have talked about regulation. Um, it, it, you know, you've got all these things where, well, they have to regulate, make sure the plans do this, and make sure the plans do that, and we know that the plans will be different in what it covers. So we're back to the marketplace where you can go to Macy's Basement or you can go to uh, Nordstrom's, uh, you know, and make your choices there. But I want to know what, what kind of regulations do you, do you think that there are going to be and how effective do you think that? Because I don't believe regulations have been at all discussed. Am I right? Um, so I'll, I'll sort of um, start. So yes, you are right that um, while um, while advocates were able to um, prohibit some kinds of ratings in, uh, in plans, uh, plans are allowed to do age rating. I think it's three times the premium. Um, so yes, they are allowed to rate, to rate people based on age. Um, and so yes, that has an, Im yes, it has an impact on premiums. Um, in terms of regulation, uh, there's different levels of accountability. So there's the regulations that are coming out of the federal government. The federal government holds states accountable. So um, the federal government is not going to hold, you know, Blue Shield, Blue Cross accountable, but it's going to set standards and is setting standards that all qualified health plans have to comply with. And the secretary of HHS is ultimately responsible. But those are going to be enforced through the state insurance commissioners. And I think that, as with everything else, we are going to see robust enforcement in some states and not so robust enforcement in other states. Um, you know, I will say in California, we have some pretty good, um, not perfect, but we have some pretty good um, standards. People have, for example, health plans in California have very specific what are called time and distance standards. So in order, your provider network has to have certain kinds of providers that are um, within X distance from the subscriber. So there are, there are, um, there are ways to put some of these things in regulation. Um, and again, the level of enforcement is uh, going to vary. That's, and that's where we come in, is holding our governments accountable the best we can um, to have them really enforcing the regulations. And then if they don't, then some organizations and help and others then you know, try to sue them and make them do what they're supposed to be doing. I don't have anything to add to that question. I apologize, but I did want to add a little something to my answer to the previous question, which is that another potential solution to things like wait times and um, challenging challenges accessing a doctor have to do with the supply of providers. Um, so supply of primary care providers initially, supply of family planning providers, and um, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act did include some funding and um, infrastructure for uh, what we call sort of pipeline measures, improving, um, incentivizing people to choose these fields, that kind of thing. Um, I 
think the latest sort of buzz is that those pipeline measures are one of the first things to go in appropriations, mm -hmm. that they're considered sort of fluff. Um, so again, there are a lot of uh, details that we need to keep our eyes on. Um, I had a question. Deb, I, um, I really liked your idea of creating a feedback loop of data so for continuous improvement of the quality of care. But can you talk on a practical level about what that might look like? For example, one can get access currently to Medicaid data, right. but having access to that data and having access to usable data and the difficulties of using that data, um, I know many people are contending with. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about what that might look yeah, like? Yeah, that's a great point. And um, I did not uh, have the time to um, say, so thank you for the question, that um, I have delved into this a bit myself, using Medicaid data to try to understand ectopic pregnancy and the experiences of women with Medicaid um, being cared for with, uh, for their ectopic pregnancies. And um, the challenges in getting the data and the challenges in using the data are great, and that comes really starting from the, the provider level. Um, so for example, um, here's an area where managed care has been a problem, and that is um, if, when I was saying before that when you go to the doctor and the doctor uh, submits a diagnosis code and a procedure code for what they did for you, um, and they send that to, their, to your insurer, they have to do that in order to get paid. So the provider isn't doing that out of the goodness of their heart to make sure that there's some nice researcher like me who can get that data. They're doing it to get paid. If that provider is within a um, capitated or prepaid managed care plan, they actually don't need to submit that encounter data to get paid. They get paid a fee every month by having you enrolled. And so even though the law actually says that they still need to submit that, that encounter data, they often don't. So, for example, Florida is one of the states that I've looked at, and we're having a little bit harder time um, getting the details of the ectopic pregnancy care in Florida because they have a high rate of managed care enrollment even going back to 10 years ago. Um, Illinois has had very low use of Medicaid managed care, um, and so we're able to get more and better data. Um, so, uh, and, and that gets to sort of the data quality issues. It also is, um, in some ways, um, an added burden on the provider, um, and that's where, again, the funding comes in. If we um, want to hold people accountable for providing good care, and we want them to send us their data for us to as assess and analyze whether they're providing good care, we need to make it feasible for them to do that while they're also trying to take care of these millions of newly insured patients um, who had never had a doctor before. So it's, um, there are lots of challenges built into the system and there aren't short-term <laughs> solutions. I think it's, it's in the, the promise category. <laughs> and I want to add, sometimes it's also the questions that are required to be answered mm. in the first place. So, for example, in Medicaid, uh, Medicaid has very, very good standards for, uh, for coverage for children. Um, there's a program, it's called EPSDT, um, Early and Periodic Screening Diagnosis and Treatment, and it requires coverage of services that might not even be in the Medicaid program. So things that adults might not be able to get, kids can get. So one of the, th and, and states are required to report basic measures to the federal government. But one of the things, so one of the things we've been looking at is um, at really delving more into adolescent health and reproductive health because providers can get reimbursed for um, counseling, uh, behavioral health services, and we want to know, well, how are they doing? Because here's a really good way to incentivize providers doing, you know, accurate, unbiased sexuality education with adolescents, but it's not one of the measures. And that means that mm -hmm. they don't have to report this. So getting them to change kind of what has to be reported would then lay the groundwork for 
getting some of this information. Thank you for saying that. I couldn't agree more. And I think we see that also. Um, I don't know if anyone's been to the Medicaid, Medicare or, or Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website, Hospital Compare. Um, right now, hospitals are rated on these quality measures. Where do those measures come from and what are they? Right now they are things like, if you have pneumonia, did you get antibiotics in time? If you have chest pain, did you get the appropriate workup to see if you had a heart attack? And if you had a heart attack, did you get the appropriate treatment? Well, why are those the measures? Because Medicare has been around a long time. Pneumonia and heart attacks are conditions that tend to happen to people in the Medicare population. And we've used that Medicare data to develop quality measures around those issues. So if we don't measure it, we don't know how good we're doing at it. There is no measure about what is your rate of unintended pregnancy. There is a lot of measure around what is your rate of diabetic control based on your hemoglobin A1C average, right? So we have to report it and require reporting of it to even know how good we're doing. Other questions? Uh. Hi. Um, Please First introduce question. yourself. Huh? Introduce yourself, please. Uh, Pauline Roth, nice interested meeting. party. <laughs> um, so first question would be, um, does Medicaid generally cover contraception? Yes. Um, Medi one of the mandatory services in Medicaid is family planning services and supplies. Um, so it must be covered. The, um, the, there, there's, it's, there's no definition of what family planning services and supplies are, which means we see a lot of variation between states in terms of what they cover in that category, but they must, uh, they must cover it. Now, there's no rule that says they must make the health plan cover it. So there is a provision that if, you're, if your health plan doesn't cover family planning services and supplies, the state's on the hook to make sure that you can go out of your plan, it's called freedom of choice, um, to go out of your plan to get those services. So a lot of it depends on, um, do you know Do you know that you have the right to get them? Do you know how to get them? Are, you, are there providers in your community? Um, but, um, but I think generally speaking, plans do cover it and it's required. Okay. Uh, so the follow-up question to that would be, uh, you mentioned you, I, being the person who mentioned it, um, <laughs> that uh, one of the reasons that the unplanned pregnancy rate um, may be so high is because uh, women aren't able to get consultations when they experience side effects and they may stop taking uh, the birth control as a result. Uh, would it be possible for pharmacists to help fill in this gap in services? Yes. <laughs> That's an easy one. Absolutely. And we should reimburse them for counseling time. So, I mean, it, is it possible to maybe encourage these women to speak to a pharmacist since you don't need an appointment for one and they're probably more available? Yeah, and again, as Susan points out, the reimbursement needs to be there. The, and at the same time, the, the standards and quality measures need to be there to make sure that the care they're providing is good. But absolutely. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, um, I was just wondering how um, the essential services are going to impact whole family, family planning and um, reproductive health for young men. Yes, okay, so um, the, the, the US Preventive Services Task Force doesn't actually, as we already heard, have a contraception as one of their preventive services. Um, and so there is an Institute of Medicine um, um, commission committee that's making recommendations to what those uh, preventive services for women will be. And we're very hopeful that that will include um, that will in include contraceptives. As far as young men are concerned, um, the, the, the Affordable Care Act uh, makes more clear that family planning services, that the language now is gender neutral, 
And so young men should be able to get uh, that range of services, which includes STD screening, access to condoms, sexuality education. Um, and so they, um, they ought to be able to get the same services that young women get as this gets rolled out. Yeah, I would just add that so men and women who are not parents are currently um, one of the, I think, most important excluded groups. Um, and when I say important, what I really mean is what I see in clinic every day. Um, and women will even say, you know, well, my caseworker told me if I got pregnant again, then I would get Medicaid and could get my diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, addressed. But since I don't want to get pregnant again, what can I do? I don't know. Good luck. So with the Medicaid expansion, um, taking away those categorical requirements for eligibility means that you will only need to be assessed for your income, not for one of those other categories. If you are a man or if you are an adult without a child, you can still get the Medicaid coverage um, if your income makes you qualify. <coughs> Oh, one more question. <laughs> okay, one more question. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Corey Bloom. I'm a family physician, and I work at the Chicago Department of Public Health. And um, the majority of the, the patients who I work with are uninsured currently, but will be hopefully brought into this new system um, in 2014 or 2013 or maybe before. But I feel like I lack, I'm lacking as a provider a lot of information about how that's going to happen. And certainly they also don't have that information at this point. So Susan, I was glad to hear that there's some thought about community organizations or advocates who will be helping to shepherd and guide people through all of these choices and what it really means. Could you talk a little bit more about that? It, what, is there funding for that? Who? We'll, well, be there's doing funding that. unless it gets defunded. But yes, <laughs> the, there are, in fact, there are, um, there were just, I think, 15 pilot grants to 15 states, and I don't, off the top of my head, know what they ought were, um, to start developing these. Um, they're supposed to be both a web portal. Every state's supposed to have a web portal, and it's supposed to be very easy to use, and supposed to be in multiple languages based on the threshold languages in the state. Um, and they're supposed to be funding for what are called navigators, which are organizations um, or um, systems that will help people get into the system, get enrolled, stay enrolled. One of the things that's really interesting, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll be very fast, is that right now, um, when, budget cut, when budgets are worst, uh, states have an incentive to keep people out of Medicaid. So we see things like new, you know, instead of being determined for eligibility once a year, you get redetermined quarterly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thing, things that make people fall off the rolls because it's too hard to comply. Well, come full implementation, everybody's supposed to be enrolled in something, and the state has some responsibilities there. So what we're hoping is that the incentives are going to flip. Maybe they won't, but we're hoping the incentives will flip and the states will be incentivized to help people get enrolled um, instead of finding incentives to keep people out of systems. Now, that may mean they get enrolled in the exchange when they ought to be in Medicaid, but we're hoping that it will mean they will get enrolled in something where they have access to care. But that, um, the states are just beginning to develop what those systems are going to look like. I want to thank this morning's uh, speakers and um, give people a chance to have a quick break and then we'll return right back here for our next keynote. So thank you so much.